All right, here's your exam prep on radicals and logarithms. Let's do it together. So can you graph a square root? So let's start with the parent points for a square root. That's 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. Underneath the square root sign, uh, we do the inverse of, of what it says. We're going to add 1 to every x. Outside the square root, that affects the y. And it does what it says. So we're going to add 2. Then I'm going to put these on the graph. And then make my square root curve. Then it says the domain. Well, the domain here starts, and it's your hk, so it's 1. So it starts at 1 and goes to infinity. Your range is your k, starts at 2, and it goes to infinity. And then the end behavior. As x approaches infinity, the function approaches infinity, but the other end behavior uses h and k. So as x approaches 1, the function approaches 2. Oh, there it is. Number 2, can you graph a uh, cube root? So in graphing a uh, cube root, start with the parent points 0, 0, 1, 1, uh, 8, 2, negative 1, negative 1, and negative 8, negative 2. Underneath the cube root, it does the inverse. We're not going to multiply times 2, but divide. So 0 divided by 2 is 0. That's 1 half. That's 4. That's negative 1 half. And that's negative 4. So divide all the x's by 2. Here we're going to multiply all y's by 2. So it does what it says. And then plot these points. So 0, 0, 1 half, and 2. Uh, 4 and 4, uh, negative 1 half and negative 2, and negative 4 and negative 4. So there's your graph. The domain is all real numbers. The range is all real numbers. As x approaches infinity, f at x approaches infinity, so the right end goes up. As x approaches negative infinity, the function approaches negative infinity, so the left end goes down. Number three, another square root to practice. So we start with the parent points. Underneath, we're going to subtract 1. So we do the inverse of what's underneath the square root sign. Then the y, we're going to multiply times 2 and subtract 1. So 0 times 2, subtract 1. 1 times 2, subtract 1. 2 times 2, that's 4, subtract 1. And we're going to plot those points. The domain is your uh, h, so it's negative 1 to infinity. Your range is your k, which is also negative 1 to infinity. And your end behavior, as x approaches infinity, f at x approaches infinity. And the other is your h, k. So as x approaches negative 1, f at x approaches negative 1. All right, can you graph and analyze a square root and a cube root? Turn the page. So can you simplify these expressions? So the square root of 4 is 2 and then divide by 2. So 12 divided by 2 is y to the 6. 128, that's 64 times 2. And the square root of 64 is 8. Square root of x squared is x. And what's left over is 2. Here, the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Cube root means you divide by 3, so it's x to the 4th and y to the 6th. Here, we have two negatives going on. So the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3, but the negative in front makes it a positive 3. And again, the cube root and the exponent divide by 3. The square root of 80 can be written as 16 times 5, 
x to the seventh can be written as x to the sixth times x, and y to the eighth is perfect. So then when I simplify it, the square root of 16 is four. The square root of x to the sixth divide by um, two, and then y to the eighth divide by two, and then what's left behind is just five x. The cube root of eight is two, the cube root of x to the fourth, well that's one x, but one x will be left behind. The cube root of y to the fifth, again that's one y, but two y's will be left behind. So what's left behind is one x and two y's. The square root of y to the eleventh, well that's really y to the tenth times y, so that's y to the fifth, and what's left behind is the square root of y. The cube root of negative 125, so what number three times itself is that? That's negative five, and then divide the exponent by three. The cube root of x to the 38, well, what multiple of three is close to 38? That's 36, so the cube root of 36 there, divide by three is x to the 12th, and then you have the cube root of x squared. Here. We're going to do some foiling. Now recognize this is a difference of squares. So I just need to go first times first, that's 11. And then last times last is negative 25. So when I put it together, uh, I get negative 14. Here we're going to go 8 times 7 is 56. And then 2 times 22 is 44. Uh, 44 is uh, 4 times 11, so the square root of 4 is 2, so 2 times 56, what, 112, and then what's left over is root 11. Cube root, cube root, we multiply the insides together, and then to simplify that, that's 27 times 2. So the answer is 3 in the cube root of 2. Multiply the numbers in front, multiply what's underneath, trying to think what would go into 66, not 8, not 27, well, then I, right? I think that's it. All right. Um, 17, when you subtract, the radicals have to be the same. So root 12 is really 4 times 3. So we have negative 3 root 3, the square root of 4, is 2 times negative 8 is negative 16. And when you subtract, you get negative 19 and the square root of 3. Here, the square root of 28 is really 4 times 7. Uh, the square root of 4 is 2, and what's left over is root 7. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by root 7. And I get negative 5 root 7 over 14. Here I get 9 plus root 2, so I got to do the conjugate. So that's 54 and 6 root 2. On the bottom it's 81 minus 2, so I have 54 plus 6 root 2 over 79, and that can't be reduced. Here again I'm going to use what's called the conjugate, so it's root 7 minus 2. So the top would be root 35 when I multiply it, and then negative 2 and root 5 can only go beside each other. On the bottom, root 7 times root 7 is 7, and 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. So root 35 is prime, so is negative 2 root 5, and that's all over 3. Perfect. Turn the page. Here's some stories for you. If three lengths of the size of the triangle are known, this is called Heron's formula to find the area of a triangle. So the area is using this formula, where S, you add all the sides and divide by 2. So we're going to add all the sides, 6 plus 8 plus 12, and then take that answer and divide by 2. So it's 26 divided by 2, which is 13. And then the formula to find the area is you start with uh, the square root and you start with 13, and then you just subtract one side at a time, and order doesn't matter. So 6, and then sub 13, take away 8, and then 13, take away 12, and then there's your answer. 
and then you'd use your calculator if you wanted to to estimate it. So if I put in the calculator, the square root of uh, 13, 13 take away 6, 13 take away 8, 13 take away 12, and then I get uh, 21.33 one if I round it and there's no units involved centimeters so it's centimeters squared. A formula is used to figure out velocity it's right here and it says that g is 32 feet per second and the height uh, of the object is falling the object is 20 feet per second squared for the velocity. So this is find the height so the velocity is 20, the gravity is 32, and then to find the height. So use that formula, plug in. So 20 is equal to the square root of 64, h, square both sides. So I get 400 is equal to 64 h, and then divide. So it's 400 divided by 64. If I wanted a different way to write it, that would be... 6.25, so then you would say the height of the object in feet would be 6.25 feet. That would be the height. So please use this formula to estimate the speed of a vehicle. So the friction is 0.25. The car is traveling at 60 miles per hour. What's the length of the skid mark? So the speed I know, which is 60, is 30 and then 0.25, and then what I don't know is D, the length of the skid mark, the distance the car skidded. So again, I'm going to multiply that together, 30 times uh, 0.25, that's 7.5. Square both sides, so that's 360, and then divide. So it's 360 divided by 7.5. And that answer is 48 and oh, 60 miles an hour. I'm pretty sure distance in feet, there it is. So this is answer is the car skidded 48 feet by going 60 miles per hour with that friction coefficient. All right, here's some other ones. Can you solve these equations? Be careful of the extraneous. So the answer at the end can't be negative underneath. So step one is to square both sides. So 2 squared is 4. Uh, step two, subtract, and you get negative 1. But when I take negative 1 and plug it in, it's fine. It's a positive number under the square root sign. When I simplify it, so it's done. Cube root, I'm going to cube both sides to undo it. So I have 1 plus x equals negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1. Subtract 1, you get negative 2. The domain for a cube root is all real numbers, so the answer is perfect. All right. Number 26, square both sides. Be careful here. You end up with a quadratic, so I need to make it equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract 5x and subtract 24. You need to factor it. What two numbers multiply to negative 24? Subtract to 5. So it's negative 8 and 3. So each factor gives you an answer. So it's positive three and negative uh, positive eight and negative three. Know that when you go back here, the answer for x cannot be negative because the square root of any number can't be negative. So negative three doesn't work. So the only correct answer is eight. We call this uh, extraneous. Uh, do you know how to simplify a uh, rational exponent? So what this means is, what's the cube root of 8, which is 2, and then take that answer to the 4, which is 16. What's the fourth root of 16? So what number 4 times itself equals 16? Take that answer to the exponent 5, and you get your answer. Here, what's the cube root of 27? So that answer is 3. Then... 3 to the exponent 4 is 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, which is 81. And then the negative exponent says, hey, do the reciprocal of that. Number 30, 
can you do f composed by g at 4 using this table of values? So what it's really telling you is, first, plug 4 into g and get an answer. So when g is 4, the answer is 11. So read the chart. It's 11. And then go to f. And when x is 11, the answer is 3. And you get your answer. Can you know how to use a table of values? Again, this means... First, plug 1 into f and get an answer. So when x is 1, f is negative 2. Then take that answer into g. So when g, when x is negative 2, g is negative 7, and you have your answer. Write an expression using the graphs of y and g to be able to go f times g at negative 1. So that means the same as f at 1 times g at 1. So when I look off the graph, when g is 1, that means, uh, or when f is 1, f is the line. So at 1, what would you say that is? So at 1, it looks like at positive 1, they both are negative 2. So it would be like negative 2 times negative 2. So the answer would be 4. Here's another one. Not the same one. No. Oh, sorry. This one was negative 1. What I just answered was the next one. So at negative 1, the line at negative 1 is 2, and the parabola is negative 2. So together, that makes negative 4. Here, I just did this one already. At positive 1, both are negative 2. So when you multiply it together, you get 4. All right. Uh, can you compose with two equations? So what this is telling you is, First, plug uh, 3 into f. So if I do that, it's 2 times 3 plus 7. <clears throat> then take that answer and plug that answer into g. So it's negative 2 over 13, and that's it. That's your answer. So again, negative 2 into f. So in this case, negative 2 subtract 6 over negative 2. So that's negative 8 divided by negative 2, which is 4. And then g at 4, plug it in, and you get 4 squared plus 9, which is 25. So this is your final answer. Can you compose two functions together, not evaluating? So I need to take f and plug it into g. So g is uh, 6x plus 2. So take out the x, put in parentheses, and then inside plug in f. For negative 4x plus 2, we could distribute. And then you get negative 24x plus 14. Again, if I'm doing this, uh, g gets plugged into f. So f is 3 over x minus 1. And instead of x, we put in 8 over 3x. Common denominators will help us here. So 1 becomes 3x over 3x. So that is 1, but now the denominators are the same. So I get 8 minus 3x over 3x. And then when you're dividing uh, fractions, you multiply it times the reciprocal. So when you do the reciprocal, you end up with 9x over 8 subtract 3x. All right, number 38. An oil well off the Gulf Coast is leaking, with the leak spreading oil over the surface as a circle. At any time t after the beginning of the task, the radius of the oil slick is given by this, 3t feet. Find the area of the oil slick as a function of time. So area of the circle is pi r squared, but as a function of time, we take out the r and put in 3t, because that's what r is. 
So if I uh, multiply that out, it's 9t squared pi. What's the size of the oil leak after 20 minutes? So then you just plug in 20 and get your answer. So that's 400 times 9. So 4 times 9 is 3600 pi, and it's in feet squared. That would be the size of the oil slick. So that, again, is a substitution question. The surface area of a pipe with length 12 inches is given by this equation. There's the formula for surface area of the cylinder. You're told the radius is given by time. And then what is the surface area after 10 minutes? So we take the surface area, but instead of R, we do it in terms of T. So wherever there's an R, we put in 1 -sixth T square. So now it's in terms of time instead of the radius. And so in time, 10 minutes, how big is the surface area? We plug in 10 to get our answer. And this is squared. So if I simplified it, you get 2 pi. I'll just put it in my calculator. So two pi one sixth times a hundred. That's all squared plus twenty four pi. And then again it's one sixth times a hundred. So the exact answer, I don't care, the approximate answer is three thousand and one point nine six six. And that's in feet, inches. And that's in inches squared for surface area. All right, turn the page. The price P of a certain product and the quantity sold X obeys this equation. Suppose that the cost C of producing X units is this. Assuming that all items are sold, find the cost C as a function of price P. So right now, cost is in terms of X. How would you do that in terms of P? So step one is I need to solve for X here. So I take P. I want to know what does X equal here? So first, I would subtract 200. And then next, to undo the fraction, I do the reciprocal. And it would stay negative when you do the reciprocal. That would be negative 3 over 2. So when I do that, that's x now by itself. So step 1 is to solve for x. I don't need to distribute. So now, when I go back to this equation, I can write it in terms of p. So instead of x, I put in negative 3 over 2 p subtract 200, and that's all over 20 plus 800. So now the equation is in terms of price rather than the producing x units. So if you have a price that we put in, we could see the cost of it in terms of it. So in this case, the price we want to figure out is 50. So then put in 50. So when I put in 50, I can uh, simplify it down. So 50 take away, I'll use my calculator. Well, here. 50 take away 200 is negative 150. I'll keep going. Uh, 3 times this in half. So 3 times this is 450. And half of 450 is 225. So it's the square root of 225 over 20 plus 800. What number t uh, times itself is 225? So it's 15 
over 20 plus 800. So that would mean the cost altogether is 800. Now 15 over 20 as a decimal is what? Divide by 5 or times 5, that would probably be easier, is 0.75. So it's eight hundred dollars and seventy-five cents. That would be the total cost. So again, step one is to solve for x. Use that and plug it in, like a composition, and then whatever value the number is, plug that in, and then do the calculating to get your answer. Use the horizontal line test. Is it one to one? Eh, fails. Hey, passes. Do you not find the inverse? So graph of a one-to-one -one is given. Draw the graph of the inverse as a dashed line or curve. So the inverse of this would be to subtract five and then do the cube root. You could also set it up like this and subtract 5 and then cube root. Same thing. So however you want to set it up. How do I graph a cube root? So a cube root would have 0, 0, 1, 1, 8, 2, negative 1, negative 1, negative 8, negative 2. And all we're doing is adding 5 to the x's. That's 5, 0, 6, 1. This will be off my graph, 13 and 2. This one, add 5, that's 4 and negative 1. Add 5, that's negative 3 and negative 2. So this is what I'm going to put on my graph. So 5, 0, 6, 1, 4, negative 1, and negative 3 and negative 2. I didn't write it as a dash line. Remember that the line y equals x, it reflects a function in its inverse. So see how one would fold over the other. 44, can you find the inverse? So we're going to write x equals 5y minus 7 over 3. How would I get a y by itself? Multiply times 3. Then what would you do? Well, you would add 7 and divide by 5 to find the inverse. And that's the symbol for inverse. Did I say add 7? I did say add 7. Add 7 and divide by 5. <laughs> How about for a rational? You'd write down x equals 4 over y plus 4. Be easiest to do the reciprocal next. And then I'd multiply by 4. So I get 4 over x equals y plus 4. And then the last step to get y by itself is to subtract. Forty-six. The weight of a bird's brain is related to the volume of the skull, how much the skull can hold, and it's through this function. So express the skull volume as a function of weight. In other words, do the inverse. So we have W and V. So we would write V equals 3.44 in the cube root of W plus 129. To get W by itself, I would first subtract 1.29. Then I would divide by 3.44. And then to undo the cube root, you would cube it. And so that would be the inverse if we're going in the other direction. So predict the skull volume of a bird whose brain weighs two ounces. So if the brain, if it weighs two ounces, you put in two for W and solve for V. 
So it would be 3.44 and then plus And that'd be about 5.6424. And that would be in, predict the volume of it, cubic ounces. If you want to know how to do that, a cube root in the calculator, it looks like this. If I want to do the cube root of 2, I would use parentheses around the 2, and I would have to change it to a fraction. So you'd have to remember that cube root is the same as the exponent 1 third. That's what give you the cube root of 2. What do I do? Oh, I have a divide sign in there. That's weird. All right, so that's what would give you the cube root of 2. So you'd have to use parentheses in the exponent equivalent of cube root. So you'd have to use the exponent one-third on the 89. All right, to remodel a, a bathroom, a contractor charges $25 per hour plus material costs. So there it is, uh, where X is the number of hours. Find a formula for the inverse. So in this case, the inverse... To get y by itself, you would subtract 3,550 and then divide by 25. And then the question is, remember what x represents. So now x represents, in this case, when we do the inverse, um, we've inversed it. So and x at first was the number of hours and the F was the total cost. So when we inverse it, X now is the total cost. So this actually computes the number of hours because it's been inversed. So at first, F at X does the total cost, but when you inverse it, now what does the inverse compute? And it computes the inverse of that, which is the number of hours. So you'd plug in the total cost and it would tell you how many hours it would take to complete. All right, turn the page. All right, oh, I think the bell's gonna ring soon. So that's up to question number 47. The next video will be 48, probably to the end, in terms of the other questions to do with it. Or maybe I should do here. Let me do two more before the bell rings. I'll do to 49. And then the next part will be logarithms and exponentials. So you have a formula to convert from uh, Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius to those in Fahrenheit. Find a formula to go in the other direction. So we're going to write x equals 9 over 5y plus 32. And then I'm going to subtract 32 and then do the reciprocal to undo what y by itself and that will be the inverse. And then to use this, you would plug in 75 and it would convert it to Celsius. So 75 take away 32, what, 43? I don't know, I'd have to use a calculator here, right? That's uh, 215 divided by 9. Doesn't go in evenly, but it is like approximately what? 23.8. So it's almost like 24 degrees Celsius. 
So 75 degrees is very close to 24 degrees Celsius. All right, an organization determines the cost per person tarting a bus is given by this formula. X is the number of people. C is the total cost. Is in dollars. Use the formula to determine the number of people in the group if the total cost is $12 per person. So this is the total cost per person. So now, could you find the inverse of that? So x equals 250 plus uh, 7y over y. In this case, doing the reciprocal is not going to help you because we have variables on top and bottom. So I'm going to multiply both sides by y. Then, if a term has a y in it, it's going to go on one side of the equation. So I'm going to subtract 7y. If it does not have a y, it stays on the right side. So 250 stays on the right side. I'm going to factor out a y. and then divide. So there is my inverse. So again, I multiply both sides by y, subtract 7y, factor and divide. Now be careful, your x and uh, see, it's been inversed. So now X is the cost per person. So if the cost per person is $12, find how many people are going. So the total number of people will be going. So plug in the cost, 12, to so be 250 divided by 5. Well, that's easier than I thought. So that's just 50. So how many total people would be going then? So 50 total. So be careful what your input is and your output is. So can you find the inverse and then answer whatever questions being answered with the inverse equation that you came up with? All right, so that's the review for radicals, inverses, and composition. I'll do another video, 50 on, to do with logarithms and exponentials. GMAT, over and out.